observation. Multi-screen viewing engages me like the kinetic equivalent of an abstract or impressionist painting. Words and images evade rational analysis, allowing subliminal hints of the future to leak through. Transient and elusive, these must be grasped quickly. Computer animations imbue even breakfast cereals with an hallucinogenic futurity. Music channels process information blips, avoiding linear presentation, implying limitless personal choice. These reference points established, an emergent worldview becomes gradually discernible amidst the media's white noise. An era of the conceivable made concrete and of the casually miraculous. Observation ends, Vite, New York Time, 11.18 p.m., log and file. It's all right, girl. In these conditions, our visitors won't yet be within 10 miles of Karnak. Ah, you see? Really, getting even this far is a breathtaking effort, given their limitations. It must be so disorientating. Their pursuit leads them deeper into moral and intellectual regions as uncharted and devoid of landmark as the territories currently surrounding them. Let's hope they know where to stop. Okay. Looks like there's no option other than a direct approach. They can't creep up without cover, and it's pointless waiting for darkness up here. There isn't any. Untrue. Just isn't any of kind we can use. If Vite truly engineering Third World War, we are approaching Heart of Darkness. Those brochures, all that crap we took from his desk, it didn't read like someone out to carve a headstone for humanity. And anyway, this is Adrian, for God's sake. Why would he want to destroy the world? Insanity, perhaps. Who's qualified to judge something like that? This is the world's smartest man we're talking about here. How can anyone tell if he's gone crazy? <sighs> ah, well. Come on, old girl. We have a few matters to attend to before they get here. I suppose I've been waiting for an opportune moment, but there's no point putting things off any longer. And no time like the present. Not coming any further, no? Fair enough. You wait here. This won't take a moment. friends. I've finished my work now, and I'd be honored if the three of you would join me for a small drink in the vivarium before dinner. I have something to celebrate. Vite out. Partying. Holocaust coming. Goddamn knotheads got a party. I can hear that God forbid I call it music clear from Madison Square. David's town slept. Deserted save for silence. I entered my former residence noiselessly. Careful not to rouse the butchers occupying it from their debauched slumber. They'll all come out fighting drunk, and it's right down the avenue. I tell you, this is a bad intersection. You never know what's gonna turn up next. Unaware that death was amongst them, they'd know its dark embrace without ever understanding why. One, however, <coughs> was awake. Oh, hi. Get you something? Nah, guess Josephine posted this like she said. Joseph. Oh, Joey, you must be her, uh, girlfriend, ex. We've been fighting. In cataract darkness, I bludgeoned him. Oh, well, I, I ain't seen her lately. No pirates came, but something worse. I looked up into faces familiar, save for their terror. No sweat, I'll wait outside the Promethean. I'm not relishing the encounter. Listen, tell her hustlers, do in tomorrow. The children wailed. I looked down at the figure beneath me. Through puffed and bloodied lips, she mouthed my name. Huh? What'd I say? Don't go away mad. There came an understanding so large, it left no room for sanity. Huh. 
Times like these, people gotta be hostile. Me and Rosa should have quit this town like she wanted and escaped from everything. I ran, but the knowledge of my damnation paced me, gloating, celebrating its awful victory. Mr. Veit, this is indeed an honor. Might we inquire what it is that provides occasion for such generosity? A life such as mine offers many things worthy of celebration, my friend. You need only look about you. Might I not celebrate the fortunes that have made this Bavarium possible? A miraculous bubble of Tropicana set into endless sub-zero wastes. Two alien universes separated by a membrane of fragile glass. What in my life does not deserve celebrating? But you are right, of course. Today marks an event especially worthy of such attentions. In many ways, it represents the culmination of a dream more than 2,000 years old. Although to uncover the reasons for my current elation, one need not delve quite so deeply into antiquity. A mere 40 years will suffice, back to my childhood. My parents reached America the year I was born, 1939. Entering school, I was already exceptionally bright, my perfect scores on early test papers arousing such suspicion that I carefully achieved only average grades thereafter. What caused such precociousness? My parents were intellectually unremarkable, possessing no obvious genetic advantages. Perhaps I decided to be intelligent, rather than otherwise. Perhaps we all make such decisions, though that seems a callous doctrine. By 17, my parents were both dead, and I faced a different decision. My inheritance offered lifelong idle luxury, and yet, needing nothing, I burned with a paradoxical urge to do everything. Do you understand? My intellect set me apart. Faced with difficult choices, I knew nobody whose advice might prove useful. Nobody living. The only human being with whom I felt any kinship died 300 years before the birth of Christ. Alexander of Macedonia. I idolized him. A young army commander, he'd swept along the coasts of Turkey and Phoenicia, subduing Egypt before turning his armies towards Persia. He died aged 33, ruling most of the civilized world, ruling without barbarism. At Alexandria, he instituted the ancient world's greatest seat of learning. True, people died. Perhaps unnecessarily, though who can judge such things? Yet how nearly he approached his vision of a united world. I was determined to measure my success against his. Firstly, I gave away my inheritance to demonstrate the possibility of achieving anything starting from nothing. Next, I departed for northern Turkey to retrace my hero's steps. I wanted to match his accomplishment, bringing an age of illumination to a benighted world. <laughs> I wanted to have something to say to him should we meet in the Hall of Legends. I followed the path of Alexander's war machine along the Black Sea coast, imagining his armies taking port after port, ancient blood on ancient bronze. Strangely, before subduing Phoenicia, he struck north towards Gordium. Perhaps because of the challenge it presented, the ancient world's greatest puzzle was there, a knot that couldn't be untied. Alexander cut it in two with his sword. Lateral thinking, you see, centuries ahead of his time. Heading south, he entered Egypt through Memphis, where they proclaimed him son of Amun, judge of the dead, whose name means the Hidden One. Under rule from Alexandria, the classic culture of the great pharaohs was restored. I followed him through Babylon, up through Kabul to Samarkand, then down the Indus, where he first met elephants of war where he'd turned back to quell descent at home. I traveled on, through China and Tibet, gathering martial wisdom as I went. Alexander returned to Babylon to die of an infection, aged 33. Amongst its ruined ziggurats, I saw at last his failings. He'd not united all the world, nor built a unity that would survive him. Disillusioned but determined to complete my odyssey, I followed his corpse to its resting place in Alexandria. The night before returning to America, I wandered into the desert and ate a ball of hashish I'd been given in Tibet. The ensuing vision transformed me. Wading through powdered history, I heard dead kings walking underground, heard fanfares sound through human skulls. Alexander had merely resurrected an age of pharaohs. Their wisdom, truly immortal, now inspired me. 
What intellectual magnificence their system encouraged. Ptolemy, seeking the universe's pivot from his lighthouse, Epheros. Eratosthenes, measuring the world using only shadows. Their greatest secrets, however, were entrusted to their servants, buried alive with them in sand-flooded chambers. Adopting Ramesses II's Greek name and Alexander's freebooting style, I resolved to apply antiquity's teachings to today's world. Thus began my path to conquest. Conquest not of men, but of the evils that beset them. Today, that conquest becomes assured, in which your unquestioning assistance has proven invaluable. Do you comprehend the triumph to which you have contributed? The secret glory that it affords? Do you understand my shame at so inadequate a reward? This is some kind of dump, right? It's where I work, okay? Not in some dinky little magazine office with a bunch of guppies. Hey, hey, fella, excuse me. I'm meeting my brother. He's the manager here. Know where he's at? Milo's in the front office. Gets off around 11.30. Josephine, can we walk for a while? I don't think there's any way we can salvage this relationship. Uh-huh. So that's it. Just like that? I tried my goddamn best, acting like you wanted me to. See, over there? I put your stupid dyke disco poster up. Sure. Same place you buy Hustler. I... Listen, I don't have to justify anything to you. I like nice chicks. You give me this political shit. Okay, I'm sorry. I... Look, this book's about relationships. I think if you read it, it'll help you understand what's happened to us. I don't want to understand shit. I just want to go to bed with you one time. I... Joey, please, I can't handle this, and I want to be straight. Oh, Joey, don't. And I want to be dead. Eventually, I came to an ash-colored shore, a dismal black ocean stretching endless before me. How had I reached this appalling position with love, only love as my guide? Behind me, distantly, a lynch mob howled. Morally, we ought to strike first. Where was my error? The freighter was heading for Davidstown. It should have already arrived. My deduction was flawless, step by step. Pausing, I stood panting, sobbing, listening to the windborne sound of my pursuers, closer now as breath returned. Planning to resume my flight, I raised my head, excuse me, and saw her. My husband's a gentleman of color, buys his paper here nights. Has he been by? She seemed to be waiting, not hovering to strike. Forget it, I see my husband now. The unspeakable truth loomed unavoidably before me as I swam towards the anchored freighter, waiting to take extra hands aboard. There'd been no plan to capture David's town. The ship was larger, nearer. I kept swimming. All my well-meaning plans had come to this. I choked, spat out brine, and struck grimly on. They'd come to David's town to wait until they could collect the only prize they'd ever valued, claim the only soul they'd ever truly wanted. My shoulders ached. The ship was massive now. It's some sort of door. I think I can burn out the lock mechanism. Palm trees buried in snow. Doesn't make sense. There. Open sesame. Nervous. Well, my stomach feels weird and my balls are all shriveled up, so yeah, I guess nervous will do. You know, this must be how ordinary people feel. 
This must be how ordinary people feel around us. Adrian. Now, what can I do for you? Damn it. You know what this is about. Pyramid deliveries are behind this whole mess, and you're behind Pyramid. Christ, Adrian, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to improve the world, like when I started out. My first case made it seem possible to end injustice by demolishing crime syndicates. This notion that criminals monopolized evil was itself demolished by my second case. I investigated the mid-50s disappearance of hooded justice. An operative, government sources revealed, had tried unearthing him back then, reporting failure. Unearthing the operative proved easier. Edward Blake. As intelligent men facing lunatic times, we were very alike, despising each other instantly. Recognizing me, he attacked anyway, mistaking me for a criminal. I studied his limitations, skillful feint, devastating uppercut, little else. He won in the short term. Had Blake found hooded justice, killed him, reporting failure, I can prove nothing. We next met in 1960. I avoided him, more fascinated by John. Still, I observed Blake over the years. Know what? He was in Dallas, minding Nixon the day Kennedy died. Nobody's sure why Nixon was there. Ever read JFK's intended speech? We in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice, the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. Was he rehearsing it, perhaps, as the motorcade reached the plaza, never suspecting that on the walls of world tyranny, Crosshairs watched him. We all realized then how bad things were. I continued adventuring, but it seemed hollow. I found only the symptoms, leaving the disease itself unchecked. I felt helpless against forces greater than any I'd anticipated. Too cowardly to confront my anxieties, I had life's black comedy explained to me by the comedian himself at the Crime Busters fiasco in 66. He discussed nuclear war's inevitability, described my future role as smartest guy on the cinder, and opened my eyes. Only the best comedians accomplish that. I remember the charred map between my fingers. Nelson saying, someone's got to save the world. That's when I understood. That's when it hit me. Hi. Gloria? I knew you came this way home, so I figured I'd meet you from work. I'm not ready to visit back at the apartment just yet. Just yet? I miss you, Malcolm. I miss the person you were. But I can't live with someone who feels driven to help hopeless cases, then lets their misery affect our lives. If you can promise me you'll ask for a transfer to different work with different patients, I can come home. Malcolm, are you listening to me? Gloria, I'm sorry. Those people, they're hurting each other. Malcolm, don't you dare get involved. Gloria, I'm sorry. It's the world. I can't run from it. Its dark and lurching mass filled all my vision. Closer it came. Closer. Brutally, I'd been brought nose to nose with mankind's mortality. For the first time, I genuinely understood that Earth might die. And yet, what could I do? I saw East and West locked into an escalating arm spiral. Here was a knot to try even Alexander's ingenuity. Both sides realized the suicidal implications of nuclear conflict, yet couldn't stop racing towards it lest their opponents should overtake them. Sooner or later, conflict would be inevitable. My plan required preparation. Each step had to be taken carefully. 
constantly striving to keep in mind the enormous scale of what was at stake. The world's present would end, its future, immeasurably vaster, would also vanish. No human vestige would remain. All our richness and color and beauty would be lost, as if it had never been. The world I tried to save was lost beyond recall. I was a horror. Amongst horrors must I dwell. A rope snaked down. Spluttering, I grabbed it. See, people don't reach out and make contact. And from the decks above, a cheer went up, both gross and black. Its stench affronting heaven. The end. You've been coming here weeks, reading that junk over and over, and yet we ain't exactly close. Cause they don't make sense, man. That's why I gotta read them over. That ain't the point. What's your name? My name's Bernie. Bernie? Short for Bernard? Well, I'll be horsewhipped. That's my name. So, don't signify for nothing. Wait a minute. What the hell's going on? Fight, pull over. Steve, you just got suspended. I'm still me, Joe. Pull her over. Oh, shit. That's Joey. That's one of my drivers in a fight. Talk about lousy timing. Each step was synchronized. John, being too powerful and unpredictable to fit my plans, needed removing. Thus, Dimensional Developments hired his past associates and gave them cancer. Yes. Weaver first, Slater and Moloch later. Unwittingly exposed to radiation, they were closely observed, cultivated as weapons against John. Meanwhile, taking advantage of new technology, I researched genetics. Bubastis was an early success, and teleportation. Since John proved teleportation possible, why develop electric cars? My researches were vital, like my island, secretly purchased in 1970. The only hero retaining public sympathy, I quit two years before the Keen Act, concentrating on my plan. Unable to unite the world by conquest, Alexander's method, I would trick it, frighten it towards salvation with history's greatest practical joke. That's what upset the comedian when awareness of my scheme crashed in upon him. Professional jealousy. Blake's murder, you confess? Confession implies penitence. I merely regret his accidental involvement. Returning from Nicaragua by air, he spotted a ship docking at an uncharted island. Suspecting Sandinista bases, he resolved to investigate. Imagine, the perfect fighting man discovering a plot to put an end to war, an end to fighting. How could genetics and teleportation end war? Well, without John's guiding mind, teleportation proved limited. Anything living died of shock upon transfer or materialized in an occupied space and exploded. But that wasn't what Blake found on the island. He found a collection of missing artists and scientists working upon a monstrous new life form. Upon learning the creature's intended purpose, Blake's practiced cynicism cracked. Though appalled, exposing my plan would precipitate greater horrors, preventing humanity's salvation. Even Blake balked at that responsibility, telling only Moloch, who he knew wouldn't understand. But I had Moloch's place bugged, and I understood perfectly. The plan Blake had uncovered was this. To frighten governments into cooperation, I would convince them that Earth faced imminent attack by beings from another world. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, Adrian, come on. What? You're serious? Perfectly. An intractable problem can only be resolved by stepping beyond conventional solutions. Alexander understood that 2,000 years ago in Gordium. Blake understood too. He knew my plan would succeed, though its scale terrified him. That's why he told nobody it was too big to discuss. But he understood. At the end, he understood. He understood the portents knew a dazzling transformation was at hand for mankind. The brutal world he'd relished would simply cease to be. After Blake, I neutralized John. Stolen psychiatric reports indicated his mental withdrawal. The cancer allegations made it physical. By then, Rorschach's masked killer hunt needed stopping. 
My own assassination confirming his erroneous theory placed me beyond suspicion. I'd hired my own killer through a third party. When I fed him the cyanide capsule, perhaps he realized this. Nothing now stood between me and my goal. Humanity's fate rested safely in my hands. Adrian, this is crazy. Who'd believe an alien invasion? Hitler said people swallow lies easily, provided they're big enough. I planned to build my monster, teleport it to a certain destination. Said teleportation unworkable. It works fine, assuming you want things to explode on arrival. Teleported to New York, my creature's death would trigger mechanisms within its massive brain, cloned from a human sensitive. The resultant psychic shock wave, killing half the city. Adrian, I'm sorry. You need help. I know this half New York stuff is bullshit, but I'm still glad we got here before you got deeper into this mess. Christ, you seriously planned all this mad scientist stuff? I mean, when was this hopeless black fantasy supposed to happen? When were you planning to do it? Do it? Dan, do you seriously think I'd explain my master stroke if there remained the slightest chance of you affecting its outcome? I did it 35 minutes ago.